Hi, everyone. It's Lynn Boutier from lynnboutier.com. I'm a certified trauma recovery coach, and I'd like to welcome you to another episode of my ongoing series entitled Monogamous at 13. This is my trauma story told from two perspectives. One is the trauma and abuse survivor, and I'm a long-term survivor of abuse, multiple forms of abuse, and multiple forms of trauma that are not related to abuse. I have both kinds. Now, there is also the dual perspective, the other perspective, which is as a, a mental health practitioner who is a specialist in trauma. And I hold a certification through an organization called the International Association of Trauma Recovery Coaches. And they are one of the top trauma recovery coaching schools in the world. They're a worldwide organization. Um, they are based in the United States and in England. And um, there are coaches all around the globe from many different countries. And I couldn't be more pleased and proud to be part of that organization. Um, people who work with trauma survivors have a, a different perspective on lots of different things um, that go on within a human being. And um, the most important one perspective that I can speak about to you today is the certified trauma recovery coach recognizes that there is nothing faulty, bad, broken, shameful, or malfunctioning about a person who is experiencing trauma. Trauma is defined as our, our normal response to an abnormal circumstance, event, occurrence, condition, or environment. That's all it is. It's just our response to, to, to use the, um, the simplest terms, when the bad stuff happens, if something bad has happened and it's an abnormal circumstance, event, occurrence, or environment, then we absolutely will not feel well. If we're exposed to it frequently enough or long enough or intensely enough, even one time, we will have after effects from that. And so that's what a certified trauma recovery coach teaches other people about. We use small amounts of psychoeducation. And we use all kinds of tools in our toolbox that help a person to understand that above all else, their responses are normal. And it takes a lot of the scariness and the trepidation out of trauma recovery when we can remind a client or an individual again and again and again and again, what happened to you was not your fault. And it doesn't mean there's anything bad about you. And you absolutely do have the capacity to recover. Well, today I'm going to be speaking about something that's a challenge when we do experience it. It's a form of abuse. And because anytime we're speaking about trauma, um, all forms of trauma, whether it comes from abuse or if it comes from any other occurrence, condition, event, environment, situation, that sort of thing, we need to be grounded when we speak about trauma or when we learn about trauma. And so I have my little grounding stone in my hand. Um, many of you might already know that I lost my holy stone this week, my lovely little stone with the holes in it that I used to hold up and show everybody. Nope, it's gone. I accidentally left it in my hospital room. I had to go to the emergency room because I got a chest wall injury and I had a badly infected finger and um, I went in for treatment and everything went great and I got to go home same day. And um, I left my stone, I brought it with me so I could be grounded if I had to have a surgery done to my finger because they do that with just a little bit of, of um, you know, local anesthetic. And I thought for sure that my finger was going to need to be drained and cleaned out. And I had developed a, a very sudden rapid staph infection in my finger. And so um, I thought, I I, if I have to sit through that, I should probably have something to help keep me grounded. I should not have taken my loveliest, my favorite little grounding tool outside of the house because you always run the risk of leaving it somewhere. And it was special to me. But anyways, I have a different one that replaces it. And um, I have done my grounding techniques. I feel anchored and grounded. I feel like I am ready to go ahead with the discussion uh, with you today. And um, if you do not feel anchored and grounded, now would be the most perfect time to pause and bring yourself for a couple minutes into a state of anchored and groundedness and then proceed. 
because I want you to feel good. I want you to feel safe and I want you to feel calm. And I want you to be able to get the benefits um, of, you know, the maximum benefits for you in the time that you spend learning about trauma. So with that trigger warning and with that being said, I'm ready, I'm ready to begin. So today's topic, this is special episode number 145. And the top it, topic is um, when someone makes false accusations against you that you are mentally ill. That can happen. I've experienced that multiple times in my life. And I've had it done to me by people in my family of origin. And I've had it done to me by people who are um, in my marital family. And so um, anytime it happens to us, and if you're not sure still yet what I'm speaking about, I'll be um, I'll clarify it a little bit. Um, if you if you do not hold any diagnosis at all of mental illness, and someone else decides that you do, and they do not hold any credentials as a medical or or um, um, mental health practitioner at all, none, um, never even taken one course in anything that has to do with psychology or behavioral science or anything in the world of um, medical science. So if a person does not have hold any diagnosing credentials whatsoever, and I'm a person who holds zero diagnosing credentials, the only thing I can say is that this person um, that I'm interacting with is exhibiting some of the factors that would be consistent with that disorder, but I can recognize them only as possible factors. And that's all there is. It's just, these things are on a list for diagnosing this disorder and they're in the DSM-5. And that is the standard practice, um, you know, the standard diagnosing tool in, at least in the United States, I don't know about other countries, but, we can look at that list to, to see if there's anything on that list that I can see actually happening in my day-to-day -day life or whenever I interact with this person, how many of these factors are actually in their behavior. And when we look at that and we're honest about it and we can say, based on that, I don't need to interfere in this person's life. I have no right to become involved in their medical or, or psychiatric care at all, unless they're harming someone and I can report this but there are even really tight parameters on whether or not you can intervene on someone's behalf and they must be being a danger to themselves or being a danger to others. Engaging in you know, self-harming or having e either um, already harmed another person or a uh, very high likelihood of, of um, negligence or harming another person. And, um, and something like that would be like um, overuse or improper use of their medication and mixing it with um, alcohol and then endangering another person doing something such as um, um, possibly risking people's lives um, in a vehicle or on the sidewalk or whatever, on the road. But there are times when someone will just arbitrarily decide that we have without without ever being conscientious and, and just looking up you know objectively at am I seeing these things in this person's behavior is it concerning enough for me to if I'm their healthcare proxy if it is um, concerning enough for me to um, or if I'm you know legally responsible for them if they're my my minor child if I see these things does it warrant some intervention or putting in a call to um, one of their providers and say, I just want you to know about this and just sharing information for the well-being of this person. And um, I just thought that I should probably say something rather than remain quiet about it. People do that all the time. And if it's done in a conscientious way for, for the genuine intention of, of helping a person uh, to remain safe or to help other people remain safe, um, you know, I, I don't see that there's a big, huge ethical issue with that, but there are people who have long ago figured out that this can be a way of abusing other people to make false allegations of uh, mental health disorders or symptoms of mental health disorders 
and then contact that person's providers and say, I, this is, this happened to me years ago. Somebody saying, I think you need to bring them in and examine them and put them in a hospital. You need to put her in a hospital. I see that this person is suicidal and there's that you need to intervene on behalf of this person, or this person is absolutely manic. Well, manic is a diagnosis. No, none of us get to actually say that someone is the clinical, you know, um, definition of manic if we don't have diagnosing credentials we do not have the right to do that we can't say that someone is psychotic psychotic is a med medical diagnosis and we are not allowed to make that diagnosis unless we hold credentials in in diagnosing uh, um, mental health disorders so when a person does that to us and they've done it at least one time, and there are certain factors around it that are giant red flags, and I'm going to tell them to you now. One is they're already having a history of being an abusive person towards you. If they have committed acts of domestic violence, and you can go on to um, the, um, the uh, domestic violence um, hot hotline, we can go to the hotline.org, you can go to um, the DuluthModel.org and you can go to different websites and you can see what are the different types of domestic violence, what are all the forms of abuse that a person can experience. And if you've experienced any of those and that person has already had an established history with you of doing things to you that are just flat out abuse, provable, documentable forms of abuse, different occasions, different times, different places, um, different witnesses, different all the different factors. If they have a history of being that way towards you. And then they start doing the psychological abuse, the emotional abuse of making false medical claims or false psychiatric claims against you to different medical providers and to other people in your life, possibly just tipping off your supervisor at work um, tipping off your neighbors, telling your children, calling your friends, going to see your parents, all of this stuff. When they start to do this, and it is in the realm of running a smear campaign, what is it? It's character assassination. For the purpose of what? Maligning you. Some of them do it for revenge. Some of them do it because um, they could be in addiction, unmitigated, untreated addiction, and completely out of control of their own behavior. Um, there are certain addictions that if, if that person is poly addicted, and then they're also comorbid with certain personality disorder type behaviors, then it can be a recipe for having an absolutely horrendous wrecking ball person in your life who is trying to do you and your image or your business or your career or your, um, your uh, reputation doing it in, in some ways. Um, I want, I won't say irreparable damage because we can repair that damage, but should we have to? Should we have to be cleaning up, and I refer to this as walking behind a human being in our life, carrying the canvas bag and a shovel and picking up their road apples? Should we have to be doing that? The answer is no. So long time ago, abusers figured out that they can do tremendous harm to you in a way that doesn't come back, back on them with any kind of recourse. And that is to do verbal, emotional, psychological abuse because it does not leave bruises and it's not an arrestable offense when they do it. Um, I'm sure there could be extreme cases of that where it could be, but usually no. And so they know because abusers are bullies and all bullies are cowards and they want to hit you and run away and hide. Or they want to picture the, 
the typical bully on the school bus when you are on the playground or in the classroom when you were a child. They do harm to another kid. And then when that kid cries out, the teacher says, stop that. Don't ever put your hands on that student again. I just caught that out of the corner of my eye. I saw you do it. And that bully will say, I didn't touch him or I never touched her. They will lie. They will deny. They will gaslight. They will minimize. They will, will invalidate your claim that they did you harm. And some of them learned it in childhood and got very, very proficient at it in childhood. Well, people who were bullies in childhood or had extremely poor boundaries in childhood and didn't have to um, experience accountability or responsibility or any consequences for their own actions or very rarely or not enough. And I'm not, and I'm not endorsing or condoning um, you know, abuse of children for misbehavior. That is not what I'm saying. We can absolutely have really healthy boundaries and very, very healthy consequences for our children when they aggress on other people. We can do, do that in very non-shaming ways that can help them understand we can't treat other people this way. We cannot aggress on other people. We cannot abuse other people in any way. But a lot of people walking on the planet right now did not get that education from their family of origin or the primary caregivers. They did not. Or if they did, the child may have been a child who had something such as conduct disorder or oppositional defiant disorder where no amount of teaching is going to get through to them because they may have um, been predisposed with o ODD. It is considered to be a genetic disorder. It means you came onto the planet already that way and there's nothing anybody did to cause it, but you thwart any kind of authority or instruction or discipline or um, even, even just a boundary that says you may not lie, you know, to a child. You can say, you know what, you can't lie to me. You can't lie to your teacher. You can't lie to um, people in general. It is considered to be extremely offensive to people. No one likes to be lied to. It does not feel good. And the child can just shrug their shoulders and say, I don't. When there's already been hundreds of incidents of them uh, being highly deceptive with you to the point of injuring other people or, or causing really negative repercussions. They don't have the ability to take accountability or responsibility for their own actions. They're extremely low on empathy. They are, have impulse control issues. They, um, they do not, absolutely do not accept any authority of any human being who um, would ever give them any guidelines for requirements of their behavior. This means in early education, you see that they do not respect their teacher. They do not respect the bus driver. They, do, they don't respect a principal. They don't respect another student. They don't respect their parents, their siblings, anyone, neighbor kids, nobody. They just don't. And um, I have had the experience of knowing somebody very, very early in their in their life, um, beginning at age 13. And I didn't know that something called conduct disorder or oppositional defiant disorder, and they're not the same. Oppositional defiant disorder is considered to be the lesser of the two in severity, but they they have some overlaps in behaviors. And, um, you know, if, if, if your child has either one of those disorders, behavioral disorder, um, there really is, is nothing you can do. There is absolutely nothing you can do to get it completely gone. They're going to have those, those behaviors and they are going to have um, social difficulties. They're going to possibly have even um, legal difficulties. They're, they could have addiction difficulties. They could have um, lots of negative consequences going off all over in their life because they don't respect boundaries. They think that they are exempt. They truly believe that they are exempt from any boundaries. Um, my my um, partner, when I was dating him in you know in school, uh, very frequently 
uh, in any reference to any authority over him, he would say these words, I will resist. I will resist. And that was just his motto, I will resist. And what did that mean? He's not following a rule. They're, they don't apply to me, I'm exempt. So people can get hurt from stuff like that. Well, when a person may or may not have had early symptoms in their life of these types of behaviors, now they're an, they're an adult and you are in some form of relationship with them, any type of relationship at all. And they can decide that they are going to start insinuating themselves into your medical records, into your practitioner's office. They might start finding out who your medical providers are and your mental health providers are. And then they will start doing their thing, which is when they decide that person needs a phone call and they need to begin orchestrating some care for you. My experience is that it has been only with mental health care in my case. And I've, I've had mental health care for a very long time, um, multiple different reasons, but being an abuse survivor and being uh, diagnosed with complex PTSD, it's absolutely essential that I have mental health care providers who um, I just see regularly and um, it, it's just for support. I just need that support and it's very, very, very beneficial to me. And it's my responsibility as a mental health practitioner, even if I didn't have complex PTSD, I still need to have a counselor that I go to so that I can keep myself as healthy as possible proactively so that I don't bring my stuff into sessions with my clients. And it would be grossly unfair for me to be doing that. And um, that is why I have a counselor where I go handle my stuff so that I don't come into appointments with with my baggage, with my um, my trauma being brought there. It's not the time or place for it. But when you have a person who just arbitrarily decides, I'm gonna fake, I'm gonna fixate on convincing people that this person in my life, I'm above them. I have, there's a power differential always, always there's a power differential involved in this to some degree. And that means that that person has a perception that they are up here and you are down here and that they somehow see themselves as some form of participant in your healthcare or some um, orchestrator or conductor of it. And that they have the right, they have carte blanche to just contact anybody that they want to and make very, very serious allegations about your well-being and attempt over and over again at times to convince whoever is your practitioner that you should be hospitalized, that you should be diagnosed with such and such disorder because they're seeing all the signs of it in your behavior and they're gravely concerned. Some of the language that they will use again is I am gravely concerned about him or gravely concerned about her. I thought that I should do the right thing and bring this to your attention because when when she comes to see you or when he comes to see you in a, a regular appointment, they might not be exhibiting it there, but boy, are we seeing it at home. We see it all the time that they're, and they're at home and they're doing this stuff and it is just absolutely intolerable. And this person needs your intervention, whether it be medication or hospitalization, or getting them into some sort of support program or something, because um, I'm really concerned that they're going to hurt somebody, or they're I'm very concerned that they're either already or going to be hurting themselves. And there's something we used to it used to be referred to as Munchausen by proxy syndrome, and there is also a different form of that. Um, and it's, I, I think it's called um, factitious. Oh, I, 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 I have to look it up on my phone. But what it is, is it's, they, they've kind of changed the name for Munchausen by proxy. Um, I'm going to see if I can find it for one second. I'm going to pause for just a moment. Okay, I was able to pull it up on my phone. This is, this is from Mayo Clinic. 
at www.mayoclinic.org. And it's from um, a heading of diseases and conditions. And this one is called factitious disorder. And there's an overview of it. Factitious disorder is a serious mental disorder in which someone deceives others by appearing sick, by purposely getting sick, or by self-injury. Factitious disorder can also happen when family members or caregivers falsely present others, such as children, as being Ill, injured, ill, or impaired. So factitious disorder symptoms can range from mild, slight exaggeration of symptoms to severe, previously called Munchausen syndrome. The person can make up symptoms or even tamper with medical te tests to convince others that treatment such as high-risk surgery is needed. Factitious disorder is not the same as inventing medical problems for practical benefit, such as getting out of work or winning a lawsuit. Although people with factitious disorder know they are causing their symptoms or illnesses, they may not understand the reasons for their behaviors or recognize themselves as having a problem. Factitious disorder is challenging to identify and hard to treat. However, medical and psychi psychiatric help are critical for preventing serious injury and even death caused by the self-harm physical or typical of this disorder. So there's, there's more um, that goes on, um, but the part that is really concerning here, what we're talking about today is, is this, the um, type of it that is called factitious disorder imposed on another. This is where they get into trying to convince practitioners that something is severely or seriously wrong with someone else and that they're the intervening person just trying to get them help. And I can tell you, the person who has done this to me started doing it in 2021 and they haven't let up. And they do this every once in a while, whether it is because they are in need of attention they're looking for narcissistic supply. They are um, feeling in, in some way um, insecure or threatened. And I've noticed <laughs> it happens to coincide with when this person goes into school to get a certification in, in a mental health discipline. It happened the first time that I was in school and it happened the second time that I'm in school and I am currently in a school program. And um, I will be graduated from that program in the spring of 2025. And um, I will I will be um, another form of mental health practitioner as well as um, being a CTRC, a certified trauma recovery coach. So um, this person found out about that and then immediately went into their same pattern of I don't like this. I feel threatened. I don't like this person to have, I'll tell you what is at the root of it now. I don't want them to have autonomy. I, I don't want them to be able to be self-supporting. I don't want them to not need me. I don't want them to have credentialed um, um, career um, career credentials, being credentialed in something as their career. Because when I first met this person, they were working a minimum wage job in a supermarket as a cashier. And I thought that that's what they're worthy of. But this person is stepping out of their paradigm that I, I kind of box them in. And this is how, the type of work that I'm comfortable with you doing. And if you're going to school and you're getting credentials in mental health, then you're kind of threatening me because I don't like that at all. And I want to, and I've even been asked, I'm not kidding. I've been asked, do you really want to do this? Don't you think that just working at a store would be better? And my answer was, this is my autonomy, my choice. This is my life, my career and I'm not hurting anyone, I'm actually going to school to help other human beings. And it's honorable work. Same as working in a supermarket was honorable work. But this is where I belong in this chapter of my life now. 
And that person, when they found out that I was going through my education to be a CTRC, they ran an ungodly, sickening smear campaign against me to try to get other people that used to be my relatives that are not anymore, but wanted each of them to come and visit me and counsel me to get out of that education and don't go into that line of work because it would be so much better if I would just leave all that stuff behind, don't pay attention to that, and let him just financially take care of me. That is such a common domestic violence issue where the person who wants power and control over the abused person or the targeted individual, they will thwart any, any effort to become educated, to become employed, or sometimes it's okay to be employed, but as long as they get to pick the location and the type of work that you're doing. And then if, if it's controlled by them, then it's okay. But if it's not controlled by them, they're going to do every single thing in their power to sabotage it. And so, you know, I really don't know. There's no way for me to know if factitious disorder imposed on another is actually what's at the root of this behavior when I experience it. But I've spoken to mental health practitioners who, who have been my support team for years and they know about it. And they know that this individual does this and they understand that that person has, I've been referred into domestic violence counseling and support group, three separate places and completed the program in each one of those places. And that, that when I found, went into domestic violence counseling and support group, that's when I found out this is not uncommon at all. There are a whole bunch of women in women's only support group and um, domestic violence counseling where they're telling the same story that I was telling. Uh, my abusive partner sabotaged when I tried to go to school. They got me fired from my job because they couldn't see me when I was at my job and they couldn't control me at my job. And they weren't allowed to call me while I was at my job because the company didn't allow it. And um, they got me fired. And same thing, you know, kicked out of school. If they won't allow you to leave the house to attend your classes or they won't allow you to get use of the computer in the home so that you can attend your online classes, if you don't show up for your classes, you cannot remain in the program. They will give you notica notification that you've been dropped as a student. And what does that give the abuser? Power and control over you. So once they've recognized how to pull the lever of coercive control over you, power and control over you, um, how to use neglect or sabotage or um, you know interference, all of these different ways of controlling how you interact in the world and whether or not you're even able to participate in the activities in the world that you chose. They will thwart your activities to have power and control over you. And so whether it's, you know, factitious disorder, um, reporting of, um, well, factitious disorder imposed on another, um, whether it's that or not, it has some some factors and properties that do align with that. And it shows me that if it's happening as a repetitive pattern, then that's something worth looking at and investigating a little bit. And then going and taking care of some things for my own safety, because this is showing me that any person who wants to harm me by falsely, I'm not kidding, asking, asking a mental health practitioner that they've never met and they're not my healthcare proxy and just calling repetitively and leaving messages saying, could you please call me back? I'm trying to get you to understand that my spouse, I'm so concerned and that this spouse of mine has been mentally ill for a very long time and really, really needs to go inpatient in a hospital and get treatment for bipolar bipolar disorder. 
they will choose a disorder and diagnose you with it falsely. It's not even possible for them to diagnose you. But if they are mentally disordered, they can absolutely have, and this is really important, they can, especially with drug addiction, if it's been long-term drug addiction and alcohol use disorder, factors like that involved in, in their health what they can begin to do is have something called paranoid delusions. They can have um, hallucinations. They can have um, fixation on certain ideas that they've made up in their head. And then they convince themselves that that's reality and that that's true. And that it's really important for them to take care of it, for them to intervene and get help for this. And so, it can simply be um, an after effect of long-term misuse of medication and alcohol or substance, whether they're legal substances, illegal substances, prescription medications. Um, it could be virtually any combination of any things. And it can lead to this um, out of control behavior. Um, some people could even call it psychosis. Um, there could be symptoms of a psychosis, meaning they're not quite in reality. They are in an alternate reality and they believe certain things are happening when they're not. And so in cases where, like in my case, for example, there, there was absolutely zero evidence anywhere in the world. And I have been seeing mental health practitioners for a long time. There have, if I had, if I had, if I was having um, manic episodes, I would be having consequences in my life. People who are manic don't feel good. They don't feel good. It interrupts their sleep. It, it, it can interrupt their, their activities of daily living in a big way. It can interrupt their relationships. There would be evidence in their world. There would be things that you could point to that have taken place that in a person who is manic, they want help usually with that, where often, I shouldn't say usually, but often they want help with that because it doesn't feel good to be living that way. And he, he, he claims over and over again that this person is bipolar. And I absolutely understand there is nothing faulty, you know, shameful, bad, broken, or malfunctioning about a person who experiences bipolar disorder whether it's bipolar disorder one or bipolar disorder two, it does not make any difference. There is no shame in holding a mental health diagnosis and there's certainly no shame in, in receiving intervention for it. For all of you who do, I couldn't be more proud of you. I get treatment for my complex PTSD and I am absolutely 100% unashamed to say that out loud, that I have a diagnosis of complex PTSD because of years, my entire lifetime. I've experienced from before I was born until now, I have experienced abuse. And I became a mental health practitioner who is specialized in trauma so that I could help other people to have the recovery that I was able to have. And so if you're experiencing or if you have ever experienced someone going out of their way to convince other people that you have, that you hold a mental diagnosis that you do not, and that you, I mean, even if you've ever had a symptom for a short time that could be seen as a symptom of a disorder, one symptom for one time for one day in your life is not diagnosing um, factors. It just isn't. It just is not. There needs to be a prolonged change in your quality of life. And there has to be certain factors present in order for a diagnosis or a treatment. And you can't really have treatment until there's diagnosis. Um, so all of that would bear out in the evidence. You would not see a person who is truly manic, experiencing mania and not having any, any consequences of that in their life, meaning 
the, re the relationships not being affected, that re really isn't so likely to happen. Or their home life not be being affected, that's not so likely to happen. Their work not being affected, that's not likely to happen. Um, their, their healthcare practitioners would have awareness. And there would be eventually a point in time, there would be some point in time where it would be, may become unmanageable and then medications would be sought out by the person who is experiencing it because they want relief. That's what every single one of us wants is we feel we want relief for when we don't feel well. And any person who's experiencing, um, you know, intense mania, they don't feel good. They would be seeking help for that because it's a very out of control feeling for many people. And I just happen to be a person who has never experienced that in my life. But someone who wants to convince someone else that you are experiencing such a thing. They think if you had a day where you were especially busy, that they can pass that off as being manic. They think that if you if you um, go to school too much, take too many courses, they can they can represent that as being manic. Um, if you have been a person for the whole time that they've known you and you've no, never done exercise, and then um, like me, I I have um, a physical disability, which is um, I had severe injuries to my my spine, and from a from a, a accident in 2015. And when that happens, um, my ability to exercise was completely changed. But since then, with the help of certain practitioners, I've learned that for, for the disability that I have, there are certain exercises that you can safely do. And um, I started going to a place where I can exercise within the limitations of my disability when I started to do that, that was another factor this person wanted control over, said, well, you've never, literally said out loud, you have never been a person who works out. This is highly out of character for you. And I'm gravely concerned about you because this is such a, such a change in your character. I, I just don't know what to say, except for, I think you need some intervention because something's going on with you. You, you, you went to school, you became a mental health practitioner. Now you're starting to work out. Um, and now, now you um, take care of your physical self. And I think you're obsessed. I just think that you're really obsessed with um, everything that you do. I think that you're um, all of it's abnormal. And um, you, you need to talk to, to somebody about this. When they start with that, that's a giant clue that they've got their dialing finger out and they're starting to call your practitioners. As soon as they start saying the phrases, I'm gravely concerned about you. You are so out of character. I hardly recognize you anymore. I am very concerned about your mental status. I really, really am. These are the tells. When a person starts doing that to us, we need to be on guard and just keep our our ears and our antenna up and just say, I think that they might have something brewing where they're, they're um, beginning or have already started to do some massive boundary crossing, <laughs> for lack of a better word for it. It is massive boundary crossing that they feel absolutely entitled to do. Now, let's just speak for a moment about what that does to us. What does a person feel? I can tell you firsthand what it feels like. It feels like an amazing, just massive, too big to quantify um, betrayal. It feels like a betrayal. If I say to someone in my life, and they say, who, who are you currently seeing? And, and we're not in relationship. They're not with me. If they somehow contact me and they want to know, who are you seeing? Who are Who is your doctor now? And my reply is, that is entirely none of your business and um, I'm blocking you. If I had forgotten to block this person, we are parents. 
co-parents of a, a mentally handicapped adult child. And so I've been advised by all the professionals that I deal with in every, every different discipline, you can't be fully disconnected from a person when you are co-parenting a handicapped child. There's other situations where it's very hard to be fully, completely disconnected from a person. Even if you, even if you are divorced, you still will have to deal with them in some capacity at some time. And it might only be a couple times a year. But when you separate from a person who does not respect boundaries, they're highly abusive, they are highly, highly inflammatory in the things that they do, and they absolutely want to trigger you into reactive abuse. It's simply when they're crossing our boundaries, they're inflicting pain on us, they're doing very specific types of domestic violence abuses, and then they'll do it and do it and do it until you just can't take it anymore, and then you, you yell or you um, you block them, or you might move, or you might um, uh, you might take a legal action against them and get a, a restraining order if it's really you know interruptive into your life and endangering you. Any kind of response that you do to get them to stop or to protect yourself, they consider that to be reactive abuse. They will consider just making a boundary to be you reactively abusing them. This is, again, it's hard to explain. It is in the realm of their reality is now an alternate reality. They're not in the same reality as you and everyone else. They have certain really deeply rooted beliefs that are not based in reality. And one of those may be, I get to injure you as badly as I feel like it, and it's never an injury. If it's coming from me and being done to you, it's virtually impossible for it to be wrong or abusive in any way. I have carte blanche to do whatever I want to do to you, and you just have to quietly put up with it. But the minute you tell me no, or if you get an order of protection, or if you make a boundary, or if you put up security cameras to protect yourself, if you do anything in the realm of self-protection and boundaries, I will I will be completely offended by that. And I will take retaliation on you for any of that, because I consider that to be you abusing me. And I will never tolerate you abusing me by protecting yourself. It's very, very twisted stuff when you're working in in the in the realm of protecting yourself from an abuser and so one of the abuses if you're not aware of it and you've never heard of this before today i'm truly sorry that this even needs to be discussed but one of, here's what we can do about it okay these are the things that we can do we can speak to all of our medical and mental health practitioners um even you know, um, say anything from from a psychotherapist to um, a licensed mental health counselor. Um, if we see um, a licensed clinical social worker, um, any kind of mental health practitioner whatsoever, and whoever is on your on your on your medical care team, your primary doctor, any specialists that you see, it's very very easy, and I've done this numerous times. When I go to them for an appointment, I say, would you please document in my chart that I disclosed today to you that I have been diagnosed with complex PTSD secondary to long-term spouse abuse. And I need you to know that I am at risk and I am receiving services such as um, mental health support, seeing a psychiatrist, seeing a mental health counselor. And I go to, um, I have been referred into a um, domestic violence and support group by my mental health practitioner. And I would like you to have this in your medical notes that I've disclosed this to you today. And if you ask them that, they pretty much have to put it in. And what this does is it builds the consistent practitioner to practitioner to practitioner support for you 
so that if something else comes into the mix or if this person begins calling that practitioner to try to convince them, let's say they call your general practitioner and say, I'm very, very concerned because my spouse is exhibiting symptoms of, um, you know, of being manic. And I think that she needs to be hospitalized and she needs to be put on medication. And um, I just wondered if you could give her a call and tell her that she needs to come in and be seen because she needs to be evaluated. And that primary doctor does not have to answer that message that they get. It'll be most likely be something left on their voicemail and they'll listen to it. And then if you haven't communicated to them that you are in a relationship or had a relationship and have, you know, um, children with, or, you know, we're in an intimate partnership for some length of time and that person is an abuser and now they are doing stalking behaviors. They're doing legal abuse behaviors. They're doing things that are them trying to get you um, falsely diagnosed with a mental disorder or, or a medical disorder. It goes a long way in protecting you to have your practitioners know this. Mine were wonderfully willing to listen to what I had to say. And if we do it really short to the point, short, keep it short and sweet. We just say to them, I'm an abused person. My abuser is trying to inflict damages on me by making levying false accusations of mental illness against me. And I wanted to know if you could please be aware of that documented in my chart. And this way, if that person calls here and they're trying to do that, you can look in my chart and say, oh yeah, she already mentioned that this person has a tendency to do this form of abuse in addition to all the other verbal, emotional, sexual, financial, spiritual, and, and uh, physical abuse that this person has been doing for a very long time and it's all documented. So documentation in your chart at any practitioner's office is a really, really, really important thing. So the more this person increases that behavior, the more these people can look and say, oh yeah, she's been talking about this to us and this happened with, you know, he's, he's doing it with her medical doctor. He's doing that with her psychiatrist. He's doing that with her counselor. And then what, what does that give us as, an, as more recourse? Now we can do these things such as if your partner, if your partner is the person who um, is the provider of your medical insurance, and in my case, that was the case for a very long time, we can call the insurance carrier and like, for instance, Blue Cross and Blue Shield, call them up and tell them, I am not the subscriber my spouse or my partner is at their work and I am covered under their plan. But I understand that in my state, there's laws protecting me, my, my private protected health, um, health information, it is protected. And they may not have my information about what practitioner I see and what for and what medical tests I've had and anything like that. They do not have the right just because they pay the insurance premium does not give them the right to have my protected medical information. So I'm asking you, I'm, I'm requesting today that from now on, any of the statements that get mailed out monthly, that if they pertain to me, if they have my name on them as the patient, they get mailed directly to me with only my name on the envelope. And if you mail that person, if you continue to mail that person my protected medical information when they are abusing me with it and they're using that information against me to harm me, I'll be calling you up again and going to a next level of speaking to a supervisor to make sure that this gets done because my health and safety are at risk with this person. They have to comply with that. I don't know if it's in every state, but I live in New York state and they most definitely do. So that's one of the things we can do. So we can stop feeding them the information inadvertently in a way that we hadn't thought of. One of the ways that they can get the phone numbers of your practitioners is through the statement from that comes from um, your insurance company. 
And some of them are extremely good at rifling through that information, putting it in their phones, and then using it whenever they want to. So that's one thing we can do to protect ourselves. Another thing that we can do to protect ourselves is to go as far down into low contact, even if we can't go full no contact. And there are extenuating circumstances where a person can't. I'm one of those people. I can never be 100% fully no contact from this person. But what I can do is go as low contact as possible. And if there's a phone call, always, always, always use a, I have on both of my phones, I have the Rev REV recording app. And what that gives me is the ability to produce the actual recording where someone did or disclosed something that they did, something that they said that they did, something that they coerced somebody else to do to you. If it ends up uh, involving a, um, you know, needing an order of protection, you have proof. But there's something that's even more valuable than that. And that is to say, if I must communicate with this person at all, make a boundary with them that says, you will only have conversations with me by email. And why would anybody do that? Because emails are extremely easy to subpoena. And you could even go to um, the, the like, it's going to cost you a few bucks a month to have this. I think it's around like between um, 30 and a hundred dollars a month, depending on what, um, with, with what brand you go with, but there's um, something called My Family Wizard and it is used in the court systems and anybody can use it. You can download the app, but it's a paid app on your phone. And what that is, is all communication must go through My Family Wizard. If they call your number, you just simply don't answer it or you can just block them and just let them know you want to have any conversation with me at all, any communication ever, it's going to go through My Family Wizard. And they're going to push and rail against it. They're going to say, it's it's cumbersome. This is what I heard. It's cumbersome. It's annoying. It's so slow. It is just, I would much rather just talk to you. And the response might be what I said, which is, I'm really not interested in what's convenient for you. I couldn't be less interested in whether or not you like this. This is my boundary. And if you want to have any communication with me, your your consistent abuse and threats and uh, malignant behavior is what has brought you to this moment. Your choices to offend again and again and again after being asked and told and implored not to has now tightened down the boundaries so much that your only option anymore can't come near my person, can't touch me, can't drive me in a vehicle, you can't come inside my space, you can't follow me, and now you can't communicate with me any other way except for through this app, and my family wizard might be one of them, or just if you want to keep it free and, and very, very simple, just email. And this way, anything that they say to you is recorded on a server and they cannot get rid of it. You absolutely cannot delete it from that server. And millions of people have had this work to their advantage. If they're working with having a person who is doing abuse and harassment in their life, and that person just simply will not cease and desist. So that's a few really solid things that we can do about it to protect ourselves. And any time that we do something proactively for ourselves as an abuse survivor, as a harassment survivor, we are empowering ourselves. What does the abuser want you to believe about yourself? That you are powerless. They want you to absolutely purchase the concept from them that you are powerless. And I can assure you as a trauma recovery coach, and I mean this with compassion and care and attunement and holding heart space for you, I have never said anything to you that is more true than what I'm saying right now. You are not powerless. It's just an illusion that your abuser 
wants you to believe. It is not true. And you you have rights and you have boundaries, and you have autonomy, and you have right to draw breath and take up space on this planet, unharassed, unaccused, unfalsely diagnosed. No one has the right to say that you have a mental or physical disorder, biological disorder, anything like that, that you do not have. Now, if they take it further into the realm of putting it in print and disseminating it to people, then you may possibly be able to sue them for libel. If they do it publicly. If they are doing it verbally, then that is what's called slander. And there's lots of resources all over the internet about what is your legal recourse? What can you do if someone is committing either libel or slander against you? Um, I don't believe that there is any legal recourse for when somebody is just engaging in what's called narcissistic smear campaign. And what that is, I've talked about it many times on my videos, and there's lots of videos on YouTube about it and, uh, and lots of other platforms. But narcissistic smear campaign is a form of character assassination and it goes out like a spider web all around you and usually it's done in secret with lots and lots and lots of backstabbing behind your back and when you find out how many people in your life have engaged in that with your abuser then it, the most uncomfortable thing for me I can only speak for what was most uncomfortable for me and that was that um, it automatically forced me into decision time when you find out that your abuser goes to that much trouble to psychologically and, and verbally and emotionally mischaracterize you and damage your reputation and your character, it is such deep betrayal. It is heartbreaking. It's humiliating. It's embarrassing. And it hurts severely. If that has happened to you or if they've been trying to get you into a clinician's office falsely or trying to get you put in a hospital on a 72 hour hold or something like that. They don't have the right to do it. And the more you document, the more you take notes, dates, times, places, incidents, who was there, who witnessed it? What was, what was it like that day? What were you doing? Where were you when they approached you? Take contemporaneous notes if you can. I know it's cumbersome. It's a lot to do. But document as much as you can to protect yourself. Because eventually, it might just come to the point where you need to have um, an order of protection. And you might have to go in to a court and share that information for your own safety. So it's no small thing. It's no light thing when somebody is accusing you of being mentally ill when you're not. And if you are not, then great. If you do hold a mental health diagnosis, remember, please, we have just as much right to care and love and acceptance and approval and support and love, compassion, empathy, care, all that stuff, all the good stuff. You are just as worthy as any other human being on this planet to have treatment and care without interference from some person who is trying to harm you. If they've ever abused you, it's okay to make a limitation and let your practitioners know they are not allowed any information. You can have them put specifically in your chart, in your file. Do not give any information to this person who is my abuser. Now, if you have any questions, I I would love to have questions in the question section um, or in the comment section. If there's anything that you are um, wanting more information on, or if you have an idea for a video that you would like me to make to discuss a, a certain topic, I'd be so happy to do that. Um, please like, subscribe, and share if you find value in my channel. Um, my subscriptions are increasing, and I really appreciate so much that people have been subbing my channel. It helps me, helps my little fledgling channel to grow, and it helps the trauma and abuse community. So thank you so much for your participation and for your um, subscription to my channel. 
and for liking my videos. If you haven't liked this video, just please hit the like button now and it would really help. And um, if you're interested in becoming a client for certified trauma recovery coaching sessions with me, um, I do one-on-one -on -one, uh, CTRC sessions um, for um, individuals age 18 and older. And um, I would so very much like to have a discovery call with you to help you to understand exactly what the a certified trauma recovery coaching process is like. And um, so you can find out whether or not it's the right thing for you. So um, you can find me at lynnboutier.com. You can send me an email, lynn at lynnboutier.com. Or you can call my phone, which is 716-994-3052. And if I can't take your call, if I'm with a client or if I'm um, doing something else, um, I will get back to you within 48 hours. And then we can set up your discovery call and we can have that discussion and I can answer all your questions for you. And I do list it as a 20 minute discovery call, but it's not limited to 20 minutes. I just had to call it something. Usually they're about 20 minutes, but sometimes they can go over an hour. So I do charge a small fee for them because I am working doing that. And um I just want to, I like to let people know that if they want to have a discovery call with me, there is a nominal fee for it. And I can take your payment over the phone, same as I do for, for your sessions. And if you live local to me, I would be delighted to have in-person sessions with you. And if you live out of my area, of course, they would take place on Zoom. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. I hope you found some value in this video. If you have, please come back again and tell your friends, invite your friends to sub the channel as well. Have the best day. Take care.